Bob Malkin. I'm a professor of the practice of biomedical engineering and global health here at Duke. I'm also the director of uh, GPSA. I'm the founder and director and the founder and the founder and director of Engineering World Health. Still the director of Duke Engineering World Health. And I am the director of a laboratory here called the Developing World Healthcare Technology Laboratory. And I'll tell you a little bit about all of these things today. First of all, a little bit about me. I did my undergraduate education at the University of Michigan um, and then did my graduate work here at Duke University. I worked for about 10 years in the medical device industry uh, designing regular uh, medical devices. The first device I ever designed was this one right here. It's part of a heart-lung machine. Uh, when they do uh, open heart surgery, they have to bypass your heart and your lungs. And this device, which um, I part, uh, designed, controls your temperature during that time. So they usually cool the body down to about 27, 29 degrees C. You're normally at about 37 degrees C. And then perform the surgery. And then at the end of the surgery, they warm you up. And that's what this device did. I worked for a company called Sarns. Incorporated, which um, at the time I worked there, Dick Sarns would show up. He had a beautiful yellow Alfa Romeo spider with a rag top. He would show up and um, he would ask really stupid questions. Um, and he would come through engineering. He was an MD. It was a great time. I really enjoyed working at the company. Next company I worked for was um, in Miami. It was called Cordis Corporation. And I designed pacemakers. Uh, this is one of the devices I designed. Um, if you want to come up later, you can take a look at it as well as I have the guts, the innards of the pacemaker, the brain, if you will, up here you can take a look at also afterwards. Basically, a pacemaker is for people whose hearts go too slow. It's extremely common. If you get to be old enough, you're likely to need a pacemaker. They make a small incision here above your pectoral muscle most commonly. This device, the box itself, is slipped inside that pocket. Then a wire, just like this one, called a lead, is snaked down through a vein underneath this bone. This is your collarbone or your clavicle. The, uh, the wire is snaked down through the clavicle, down through a big vein right here, right here, called the superior vena cava. Then it drops into your right atrium and eventually into your um, left, sorry, your right ventricle right there. And it does its job of continuing to pace the heart, uh, potentially for the rest of your life. More than probably a million people uh, were implanted with devices that I designed or worked on in manufacturing. I worked for quality assurance for a while as well, as well as design, which was my main job. I then actually moved to Switzerland, uh, worked for a company called IA Microelectronique. Uh, one of the great things about being an engineer is everybody needs engineers. I have never been wanting for work my whole life. Um, and I've worked all over the world. In, in fact, in Switzerland, I did basically exactly the same thing. I designed pacemakers for a company called ILA, which is a French company, and Dr. Osika, which is a German company. I also designed from some Italian companies. I worked on an infusion pump for a company called Nova Nordisk, which is a Danish company. Great beer at Danish business meetings, by the way. <laughs> Little tip for those who are looking for work. Um, I also designed watches. It turns out it's very hard to work in Switzerland as an electronics engineer and not design watches. So this is one of the watches I designed. It's called an Omega Seamaster and actually have the guts of a Seamaster up here. Here's another tip for you. The guy who sat next to me designed the guts of the Swatch, which is another Swiss uh, manufacturing, Swiss uh, made watch. It's the same guts that's in a Rolex. <laughs> So if you're buying a Rolex to keep time, you're wasting your money. <laughs> um, after that, I moved to Thailand, actually, um, and taught English as a foreign language. The reason I moved to Thailand is because I'd, at this point, I'd been working for about seven years in the medical device, no, more than that, probably nine years in the medical device industry, and I discovered working for a living sucks. Um, if any of you have an alternative, please come afterwards and tell me how I can get paid without working. Um, and uh, so I moved to Thailand and uh, really enjoyed it. Actually, I loved living in Thailand. I really loved living in Thailand. But I got a call from a guy named Theo Pilkington here at Duke. He said, if you come here, I will pay your tuition. I will pay you a salary. I'll give you a lab space. I'll give you a desk. I couldn't say no. Um, so I came back here. Then I met my wife and things changed quite a bit in my life and um, I've been living here uh, most of the time after then. However, after here I moved to a different university. I actually worked at Columbia University in New York City as well as City College of New York. Then I moved to the University of Tennessee, University of Memphis, and then actually moved back here as, uh, at Duke in 2004. So I've been here about 10 years as a professor. 
My lab, as I mentioned, is called the DHT Lab, or the Developing World Healthcare Technology Laboratory, and we focus on medical technology in the developing world. And the sort of the basics, the fundamentals, the base upon which we work is this statement by the Director General of the World Health Organization. About 70% of medical, she actually said 70% of critical medical equipment does not function. 10 to 30% of donated medical equipment never, uh, that should say, never becomes operational. In fact, if you look down in this, pot, in this corner here, this is a pile of donated medical equipment. Some incubators there, bedside monitors. This is all donated to a hospital that we work with in Nicaragua. And the question is why? Why is all of this stuff working? So stuff which was donated from Duke University Hospital right across the street from my office, a week later, it's in a developing world hospital, and it doesn't work. And the question is why? What is going wrong, and what can we do to make that better? That's the focus of our lab. The most common answer that I get from most of the freshmen that I work with and, and others who maybe haven't studied the area too well is give them money. Send money. Obviously, the problem is they're poor. So poor people give them money. It's a logical connection. Actually, that's not true. If you take a look at this graph, I've graphed the per capita healthcare expenditures. That's basically how much are we spending per person per year on healthcare on the x-axis. On the y-axis is life expectancy. It's one of the common measures of the quality of healthcare. For a couple of things you notice out of this graph, there is one country that spends way more on healthcare than anyone else on the world. They are way over to the right. That's that country. Um, but notice actually that uh, many, many countries here have better healthcare than we do. But uh, we spend way more than everybody else. But focus on the poor countries here. If you expect money to make a difference, you would expect a positive slope among all these dots here in the poor corner. Actually, if anything, there might be a negative slope coming down here for the poor countries, but there's certainly, at best, a vertical line, meaning no relationship between money and slope, and, and sorry, life expectancy. And in fact, that's true. Um, the solution that a lot of people have tried is just dump money into these poor countries and actually typically makes things worse. It does not, in fact, make things better. One way, one insight that you can see, or one way that you can begin to understand this, and by the way, I teach a freshman class, a focus class, meaning that I live, I, I don't live, they all live together, and I study with them, and we eat together, we're going away next weekend together to spend the weekend together, so this is really a focused study. If you're in this class, we begin, we, we spend most of the semester trying to understand the differences in healthcare technology implanted in the developing world and the developed world, but this slide gives you a taste of it. If you look at this slide, uh, on the left, I've, I've put the most developed nations, five most developed nations. On the right, the five least developed nations. And this is the cause of mortality. In other words, what are people dying of? What is killing people in these countries? Now, first of all, there is some overlap. Look at the top two. Um, ischemic heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, those are both on the top for both. But look below that. There is almost no overlap. Look, for example, number seven. Diarrheal disease. How many of you know somebody who's died from diarrhea? Uh, it's really uncommon in the developed world. But in fact, it's the fifth leading cause of death in one of the villages that I go to in the summers with my students. Um, it's the fourth leading cause of death for kids under five. It's a huge problem. Diarrhea is a huge problem. Basically, what you're looking on here is most of what you see on this list and most of what you see on this list, they're different. The people are dying from different things. So if you just dump money at them, that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, there, there's not technologies. There's nothing they can buy with the money that's going to solve the problem. Before I leave this slide, I just want to point out a couple other things that I deal with with my younger students mostly. Some students get very focused on a given disease, uh, you know, like malaria. You know, man, if we could only solve malaria, man, we could really solve the developing world's problems if we could find a vaccine for malaria. Uh, no, that's not true. Malaria is only about 2.7%. In fact, diarrhea kills more than twice as many. Perinatal conditions, that's basically uh, being born or giving birth, kills far more people than even HIV. Even if you could eliminate HIV tomorrow, that's only about 6%. Uh, it's a little, it's actually a little bit less, five and a half percent. 
So uh, there's not going to be a silver bullet. Just finding a vaccine to something, that is not going to solve the developing world's problems. Last point I want to make on this slide is this last one down here, road traffic accidents. Two and a half percent of all deaths are caused by road traffic accidents. Yet we know exactly how to prevent road traffic accidents. Have paved roads, have street lights, seat belts, airbags. This is a case where we have all the technologies that we need, and yet we still cannot make it work. So clearly there's a big gap between what we have and what they need. Um, this slide is um, actually, the reason I want to show this slide is because, first of all, a lot of this work was done by an undergraduate. In fact, most of the work done in my lab is done by undergraduates. Um, I have some graduate students also, but I have a lot of undergraduates starting from freshmen through seniors. The second reason I want to mention this is because this was the data that the Director General was quoting when she said that 30%, 10 to 30% was out of service. Actually, she should have said 38.3%. The reason she didn't say that is because she had an early version of the paper. Um, the other reason I wanted to, to highlight this is this number down here, 95, 96%. Most, so we, we surveyed over 100,000 pieces of equipment. That's a lot of undergraduates looking at a lot of stuff. Um, and what we found is the vast majority of medical equipment is donated. That's what we expected. These are very poor places that the people in my lab are going to. 5% of it was locally produced. And this is the 5%. Wheelchairs, lighting devices, and balances. That means weighing devices. Balances are weighing devices. The reason that matters is because those are also the top three donated pieces of equipment. So think about that. Every time you donate a piece of medical equipment, you are likely putting somebody out of work, somebody in the local community. Every time a lighting device is donated, that means somebody just lost their job. Is that really what you want to do to the developing world? Are you really trying to increase unemployment in the developing world, especially in this critical sector? Now, let me tell you a little bit about how we get this data. I've, I run um, several programs which send undergraduates overseas um, every summer. And actually, we actually have now year-round trips. I have a student leaving for Zambia in about two hours. Um, but so we, this is the, probably the largest program that I run. It's about 50 students a year. Um, this is 2015, it'll be 50 as well. Mostly biomedical engineers. It's actually open to students from all over the world, all over the country, but the vast majority of them are, are students which we call Duke Engage students. Duke Engage is a program which makes this program completely free. Uh, this, this trip is completely free to Duke students. In fact, they get actually a little check to spend for internet and a few other things. Um, airfare is covered, all the visas, everything is covered if you're a Duke student and you um, apply, it's actually quite competitive to go on the trip, but if you apply and are accepted, you can go on this trip. It's a two-month trip. It's actually about nine weeks. We have it in Nicaragua and Tanzania. The first, first month is spent studying, so the students study medical equipment in resource-poor settings, and the language and culture. So in Tanzania, I really do expect my engineers to learn Swahili. Most of them can speak some Swahili by the end of the month. And in Nicaragua, Spanish, I actually get quite a few of my engineers who already speak some Spanish so they can get quite proficient by the end of the month. And then you go into a poor hospital. We send them off in pairs, so two students per hospital, some of them many hours away from the nearest Coke machine. Um, and they have to fix medical equipment. They go in every day into the hospitals, they fix equipment, they install it, they train people how to use it. And this is how we get a lot of our data. Uh, this is Matt Christensen, and that is his host sister, host father, and host mother. Most of it is homestays. We try to find homestays that speak absolutely no English. So if you want to go to the bathroom, you got to learn the word for bathroom in Swahili. Uh, if you want to eat, you got to learn the word for fork in Swahili. Um, and that is a giraffe. Um, one of the problems that I faced when I first set up this program is people told me, you're nuts. You're nuts. Undergraduates cannot go into a foreign country where they don't speak the language, they don't know the culture, they've never worked in a hospital, and expect them to do anything. That's crazy. They're never going to do anything. They're going to be a burden on the hospital. Absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. 
uh, that we've actually been running the program this uh, 2014 was our 14th year so 2015 the year we're about to start recruiting for October 1st I think is the first deadline uh, will be our 15th year of running the program more than 6,000 pieces, uh, more than 5,000 pieces of equipment, almost 6,000. Actually, it's more than 6,000. This doesn't have 2014 numbers. It's more than 6,000 pieces of equipment have been put back into service by my students. Um, many millions of dollars worth of equipment. In fact, I am pretty sure this is true, that this program is the leading uh, provider of working medical equipment in uh, the hospitals. In fact, I'm sure we are the leading provider of working medical equipment in the hospitals that we go to. The students have a huge impact. This is uh, Ben Schnitz, and that is an AMX4 uh, portable X-ray from GE, and that's a typical waiting room in the developing world. Now, another program I run is called GPSA, Global Public Service Academies. This one has kind of an odd story. It was a Duke Engage program. Remember, I mentioned Duke Engage allows Duke students to go free of charge on the program. Um, in fact, we had students sign up for it as a Duke Engage program. Then it was not a Duke Engage program. Then it was a Duke Engage program. And now, right at this moment, it is not a Duke Engage program. Uh, that matters because this is Anna Brown. Anna Brown is a Duke student, but she's actually a medical student. Medical students are not eligible for Duke Engage, but she is eligible for this program. And uh, that is actually Megan Chang. She is now at Harvard. And that is half a person I don't recognize. Uh, this is a classroom, obviously. They're teaching. Anna is teaching about um, nutrition. This program is actually geared towards high school students. So the college students are mentors for groups of five high school students, typically five at a time. In this case, Anna only has two, Megan and Mystery Lady. Um, and, uh, but they typically have five. And um, uh, they go into very poor communities and uh, teach. Um, they also do other hands-on work, but a lot of what they're doing is teaching. It's a partnership with Harvard. That's another thing which is convenient. I don't have to follow the Duke Engage rules. As a non-Duke Engage, I can reach out to other universities. Um, that's why Megan is from Harvard. This is a great program. It's for mostly high school sophomores and juniors, although we do accept some freshmen and seniors in the program also. Uh, we actually now have departures all year round, one, two, and four week departures. These are the three cities we go to, Shayla, Calwitz and Belize. Calwitz is actually one of my favorite sites in the world. Absolutely gorgeous, dirt poor, no streets, um, great 4G for some reason, but no roads, no Diet Coke, which is one of my measures of poverty. Um, and, uh, but it is absolutely beautiful. The people are wonderful. They speak a language called Chuch, uh, extremely difficult to learn. I'm on my third year of studying Chuch and I cannot speak a word of it. Um, but it's a beautiful place. Belize, which is an English language program, and Shayla, which is our Spanish program. Um, it's again split between training and service, culture, technical, and language training, so very much like the EWH program I mentioned before. Service is delivering health care, so that's Monica. And she is vaccinating this child. This is a child, those are eyebrows, nose. She's vaccinating this child, that's the mother. She's vaccinating the child against rotavirus. Uh, the interesting thing to think about when you think about vaccinating against rotavirus is why bother? Every person in this room has had rotavirus. I can pretty much guarantee you it's one of the most common diseases in the world, and the only thing it causes is diarrhea. So why would you bother? Remember, it is the fourth leading cause of death. Diarrhea is the fourth leading cause of death. So nobody here has been vaccinated against rotavirus, but in the developing world, everyone is vaccinated against rotavirus. Just to tell you a little bit more about what my students do, this was a very large study done by Allison Keene, who was an undergraduate with me in a program called Pratt Fellows. Uh, we actually have another one called the DHT Lab Fellows. This is a program where students, selected students, again, it's competitive, can work with me for about two years approximately um, in the lab, really getting focused on an area of research. This one was about BMET training. So remember that 40% of the medical equipment in developing world hospitals is broken. Turns out a lot of it is easily fixed. So Allison went through 4,000 broken pieces of equipment and analyzed them one at a time, what was wrong with them. It turns out that there was only a handful of skills, and that's what this map is showing. It turns out there was about 117 skills that were required, and only 117 skills. This was really groundbreaking because mostly the developing world comes to places like Duke and says, we want to set up a biomedical engineering program just like yours. 
That's dumb. That's not what they need. What they need is working medical equipment. But it turns out even if they went to like Durham Tech or whatever, Wake Tech, and tried to set up a BMAT program or an EE program, that doesn't work either. Uh, the question was, why doesn't that work? We're setting up all these great schools, and it's not improving conditions. It turns out we're teaching the wrong thing. So we came out with a new curriculum. It was actually reported in the Wall Street Journal, if you're interested in that. And uh, that curriculum is now the national curriculum in Rwanda uh, and Honduras. Cambodia is going to be switching over to this curriculum in a few years. Ghana just started, and Nigeria, we're starting. Actually, the first trip to Nigeria is scheduled for just a few weeks. But actually, it's having quite a regional effect. So the school in Rwanda, this is a picture from the school in Rwanda. This woman is actually Ugandan, though. And this woman is Tanzanian. Um, so actually, the entire region of East Africa is becoming influenced by this new curriculum. 100% developed by undergraduates. In fact, the business plan was developed by undergraduates as well. And it's had a huge impact in Rwanda in a matched pair study, which uh, was published last year. Um, something like 35% reduction in out-of-service equipment. So a huge impact. Now, another thing my students do is develop brand new pieces of equipment. Remember what I said, that they're suffering from different things. And in fact, the conditions are different. So simply buying American equipment and dropping it into the developing world does not help. And here's an example. This is a piece of equipment developed by these three guys. They were in my senior design class. I teach a senior design class every semester called Design for the Developing World, where the students design medical equipment for the developing world. And they designed, this is the prototype, they designed this device. This is the device that was in manufacturing, uh, which is called Photogenesis. They launched a company, actually this guy, Vijay Anand, launched a company uh, called Photogenesis Medical. And uh, this is a device aimed at hyperbilirubinemia, which is also called jaundice. Very, very common. 50% of kids in the US are born jaundice. Both of my children were born jaundice. In the developing world, it's actually even more common. 80% of kids in the developing world are born jaundice. The problem is it's relatively easy treated. Take your kid out in the sunlight, for example. Um, put them under a very intense blue light. Turns out 455 nanometer, which is a very, very blue wavelength light, will uh, break down the molecule and make it water soluble and solve the problem. Uh, but we work in a lot of communities where it's not appropriate, it's not culturally appropriate to take your kid out within the first few weeks of life. Or they live in the jungle. Or the kid's born in the rain, um, so there is no sun. This device is, um, and, and actually phototherapy lights, that is to say lights that give this intense blue light are widely available in the US. There's 50 or more across the street here in the hospital. Problem is they also don't have electricity, so you can't plug them in. This was a device um, designed to run on a motorcycle battery. Um, so you take the battery out of the motorcycle, plug it in, and now you can treat your kids. It also uses a light bulb that lasts five years. Tens of thousands of children have been treated by this device, 100% designed by undergraduates. This is a device There was a big spread in the New York Times a couple week ago, weeks ago about this device, if you care about what the New York Times reports on, uh, mostly featuring this guy, David Walmer. It was a device designed in, in collaboration between myself and David. Um, for treating cervical cancer. Uh, most women in this room uh, should be getting a pap smear regularly. If you think about it for a minute, that is terribly inappropriate for the developing world. Think about what it takes to get a pap smear. First of all, you go into the doctor. Of course, that means you need a doctor. They swab basically what's a sophisticated Q-tip against the cervix, stick it in an envelope, send it off to the lab. The lab smears it. The pap smear actually is a smear. Smears it, stains it, looks under a microscope, looks at the shapes of the cells. If a cell is the wrong shape, calls back the doctor and says, hey, there's something here. The doctor then calls you, the patient, and calls you back into the office. That's never happening. Forget it. First of all, in all of Haiti, there is one person that can read these slides, the entire population. So there's no way there's going to be someone reading these slides. The other thing is, most of the patients we deal with don't have telephones. They don't have addresses. They don't even have family names. It's just Jane, who lives down the road in the dirt hut. Um, you know, how are you going to call that person back um, to have them come into the office? It's completely unrealistic. So we designed uh, with David this device. It's a head-mounted, battery-operated colposcope, which allows the doctor to go into a village, screen every woman in the village, and treat every woman in the village, if needed, in one visit. 
It's uh, been treated on, on thousands of women now. And actually, it's a very interesting business model, also designed by the undergraduates. And if you're interested, you can go to that website and uh, take a look at their business model. Here's another one. Um, this is this device here, and I have a bunch of them. You can come up and take a look at it afterwards if you're interested. It's a device completely designed by my undergraduates also. Um, it was also reported in the New York Times as well as The Guardian if you prefer to read English newspapers. Um, this is called a Pratt Pouch, and it is a device that prevents the transmission of HIV from mother to child, as most of you probably know. The primary mechanism of transmission is not sexual transmission in most communities that we go to. It is actually mother to child transmission of HIV. And uh, uh, in those communities, this device, this little device can prevent that transmission. It's in clinical trials in Tanzania, Ecuador, and Zambia, and actually has uh, more than 3,000 uses of this device. So that's more than 3,000 times HIV has not been transmitted from the mother to the child. All the work is done by undergraduates. In fact, I have two undergraduates right now working on this, either as independent studies, which means they get credit for it, work studies, which means I pay for them, or as I mentioned, uh, Pratt Fellows and DHT Lab Fellows, which is a junior-senior program where they can work with me for several years. All right, that is all the time I have, but I would be glad to answer a couple of questions if you have some questions. Unlike Missy, I am scary, so I totally, totally understand why you wouldn't want to ask me any questions. Yes, yes ma'am. Absolutely. Well, good. That is my job, is to get you curious. Actually, my job is to get you thinking, but I'll, I'll live with curious. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it's a drug delivery system. We have had a drug in the U.S. that prevents the transmission of HIV for more than 20 years, 25 years we've had the drug in the U.S. It's actually now available in generics. Uh, it's that old. And um, the problem is the only way you can access that drug, including in the U.S., is if you give birth in a hospital. 95% of Ethiopian women give birth at home. 70% of uh, Tanzanian women give birth at home. In the community working in Zambia, 70% also, 67%, give birth at home. They have no access to the medication. So what the pouch does is give them a drug delivery system they can manage. The, the pouch is filled at the hospital. It's given to them antenatally, meaning before they deliver their babies. When they go home, if for whatever reason they end up going home, they uh, take the pouch, they just tear it open, and then they dribble the med in the kid's mouth, and that prevents the transmission. Some more questions, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Right. So the, the question was about corporate launch. We've had seven companies launched out of my laboratory at this moment. Uh, of those products, I think six are still in manufacture. So I feel like we've been very successful. Now keep in mind, I've had over 100 undergraduate projects in my lab. So seven out of 100 or eight out of 100 is not universal. Nevertheless, I'm very proud of the success rate that we've had. We do better than most commercial um, uh, incubators. But the question was around uh, intellectual property. What a pain in the rear end. Um, I cannot give you a simple answer like we negotiated like this. You know, I get dressed up in later hosen and I go sing a song and all of a sudden we have licensing rights. That's not the way it works. Um, it is very complicated. Um, fortunately for me, uh, most of our devices have no commercial value. In fact, we don't work on anything and I won't accept a project if it has any potential use in the U.S. That makes it easier because the university has no financial interest in the product. That does not mean the university has no interest, but they have no financial interest in the product. So fortunately for me, the negotiations tend to go well, but it is a huge challenge. Um, and it's not just between me and the university. The undergraduates involved may feel that they have some ownership. I typically have projects that will pass from undergraduate team to undergraduate team, sometimes for years, sometimes seven or 10 years of development. So ownership is very complicated. So it is not a simple uh, answer, unfortunately. Probably have time for one more question, I would guess. Yes, ma'am. What opportunities do freshmen and sophomores have to work with you? You said Pratt scholars and juniors and seniors. Freshmen and sophomores? 
Absolutely. So I've got two freshmen. No, I'm sorry. I've got three freshmen working in my lab right now. Um, and um, I have two sophomores, one junior, and two seniors. So I definitely take them from all, all, all the grades. Um, in fact, I have one fifth year, I think, which is very rare, actually. I very rarely get a fifth year student. Almost everybody graduates in four years. Um, but um, you're absolutely right. The Pratt Fellows and the DHE level Fellows is the junior and senior year. Um, they can work with me abroad, that is in one of our hospitals, um, either between the freshman year and sophomore, or between sophomore and junior, or junior to senior year, and I get all of those. Although we don't get too many going abroad between freshman and sophomore year because it's competitive to get into those programs. Uh, freshmen enter into the lab two ways. They enter in as independent studies. That's very rare. I almost never take an independent study freshman. Or as a work study, meaning that I pay them to do work. And I take one or two every year. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for coming, and please enjoy a beautiful day. <laughs>